I invite you to partake on an exciting educational journey related to public health theory, practice, and research. You shall discover on this learning adventure that the art and science of public health is inter- and multidisciplinary in nature, very complex and broad, and continuously evolving over time. In this particular lecture, Lecture 6, we shall examine challenges facing patients with dementia. This is a special collaboration between Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health in Whitby, Ontario, and the University of Ontario Institute of Technology located in Oshawa, Ontario. So let's begin by first examining what exactly is dementia. Well, dementia is often defined as a chronic and progressive neurological disorder that results in the deterioration of mental processes. The actual cause of dementia is not known per se, and is often the result of a variety of diseases and injuries that affect the brain. So what are some of the major types of dementia? Well, dementia, first of all, is really this umbrella term that has many subtypes. And of course, the most prominent type is Alzheimer's disease. Al Alzheimer's disease affects about 75 to roughly 80% of all cases of dementia. The second most prominent one is vascular dementia, somewhere between 10 and 15% of all clinical cases. Other types of dementia, worth noting as well, are frontal temporal types of dementia, or PICS dementia. We see Parkinson's disease-related dementia, and some other subtypes as well, such as Creutzfeldt disease-related. So what are some of the common signs and symptoms associated with dementia? Well, first of all, clients often exhibit changes in their short-term memory. They forget where they put their keys, they, they forget um, what they ate for breakfast, for example, and over a period of time, as the disease continues to progress, their long-term memory, or LTM, also deteriorates. And eventually, some, some clients will, for example, revert to their primary language that they learned if they spoke German or Italian as their primary language. For example, they may forget, actually, how to speak English and revert to that primary language. So there are various clinical sort of challenges uh, that primary health care uh, providers are faced with when dealing with patients with dementia. There is, of course, increased confusion and decreased concentration. They really have problems concentrating. You may, may see personality and behavioral changes as well for these individuals. Some may become very um, outgoing individuals, very friendly individuals, may all of a sudden become a little bit more hostile, more agitated. Um, e even, uh, um, and of course there's apathy and withdrawal from society, and many of them also experience, unfortunately, depression, which, which compounds many signs and symptoms. There is also a decreased ability to carry out ADLs or activities of daily living. And these are things like combing their hair, brushing their teeth. These will deteriorate over time, and eventually they'll actually forget how to brush their teeth and, and, and comb their hair. And of course, um, one of the cardinal signs is confusion and disorientation related to time and place. So, so these clients may wander, for example, during the early stages and not realize where they're going, where they've been. They get totally confused uh, regarding their, their environment and location. An interesting report by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada entitled the Rising Tide Report really highlights some of the challenges that are facing Canadians with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. It, the report first of all begins by noting that there are currently over half a million Canadians living with dementia. And Alzheimer's disease accounts for about 50% of all new cases of dementia for older Canadians age 65 and older. And by 2038, it is predicted that 1.1 million Canadians will have, uh, will have dementia and the cumulative economic burden will in fact be in excess of $872 billion. So these clients are going to be a big challenge 
uh, in the years to come as our population ages. We will need healthcare professionals and, 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 and other experts uh, to deal with this increasing demand and growth for dementia. So let's take a look at some of the Alzheimer's disease stats and trends in Canada. So here we see a graph, 2011, 2018, and 2031. And what is striking about this particular graph is we look at 2011, we have roughly a half a million Canadians when the Rising Tide report came out that reported having dementia in Canada. That number currently in 2018 is approximately 747,000 individuals. And by the time we hit 2031, which is just around the corner, we can see there's going to be 1.4 million Canadians living with dementia. Not only in Canada is this a huge problem, this is in fact a global health problem that has been identified by agencies such as the World Health Organization. So let's look at some Alzheimer's disease global stats and trends. Here we see 2010, 2030, and 2050. What, what we see cases here in the graph in red is 35.6, and that's million cases globally. In 2013, that number will jump to 65.7, and by 2015, over 115 million individuals around the world will be living with Alzheimer's disease as our population continues to uh, age, not only here in Canada, but also as a global trend as well. Not only is it a challenge to deal with these increased number of cases clinically, but of course, healthcare costs will also increase exponentially. So here's a graph looking at some of the trends that are occurring. So we have to begin with is 2011, and we note that these are the healthcare costs in Canada. In 2011, it was $8.3 billion. In 2016, it was 10.4, and by the time we get to 2031, that number will be approaching almost $17 billion. In addition to direct healthcare costs, there is also indirect healthcare costs. And what is interesting is we look at the estimated 19.2 million hours of informal unpaired, unpaid, I should say, caregiver time occurred in 2011 alone. And this was valued at 1.2 billion. So these informal caregivers are often family members, typically females um, or wives who look after uh, husbands and, and, and loved ones with Alzheimer's disease in their own healthcare, uh, in their own uh, uh, home setting until they become, they become unmanageable. Um, they may wander outside, their safety issues, they may leave on the stove, for example. And of course, they're, they're, uh, they're in a, they're, they have an inability to care for these individuals and they require some placement typically into a long-term care facility, a nursing home. So now we would like to uh, present to you some interviews with some primary healthcare professionals and also some experts on dementia from Ontario Shores who deal with this issue on a daily basis. I would like to welcome uh, ANSI Colin Cherry. Uh, from Ontario Shores uh, Centre for Mental Health. Uh, Ansi, could you tell me a little bit about your role on the Geriatric Dementia Unit here at Ontario Shores? Yes, I, um, I work as a registered nurse on the Geriatric Dementia Unit and um, I work along with the physicians, the psychiatrists, um, the nurse practitioner and uh, other uh, registered staff which are RPNs, uh, registered practical nurse and uh, personal support worker. Um, so um, another interdisciplinary uh, team. Um, so you mentioned all these different teams that you work with. Um, so could you tell me, from your, based on your clinical experiences, why do you feel it is necessary to have all this interdisciplinary and interprofessional sort of um, collaboration for taking care of patients based on your, your experiences here? Yes, yeah, so yeah, well, um, it, it is very important because uh, we all are specialized in different areas right. and yeah. uh, it brings more to the table, uh, the, more, um, the more knowledge you have and um, um, it helps with their um, uh, quality of life, the patients here on GDU. And um, I mean, it's, it's very important, the col this collaboration to 
uh, gain their um, best quality of life, what they can achieve uh, by uh, their treatment at uh, geriatric dementia unit. Yeah. So, so the care is not really one person does this and one person does that. It's really a team approach here it, to it, look after it sure the, is, the, the patients. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The nurse, uh, the registered nurse, take care of like kind of take the charge role. And then uh, there's a registered practical nurse. We all like work together mm -hmm. to provide uh, their help with their ADLs and uh, so um, ADLs assistant, are activities of daily living. Uh, yes, yeah. activities of daily living and their feeding, medications, and communicating with the physicians what their our findings are. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I mean, say o occupational therapists would take care of their um, say assistive device um, mm -hmm. to have their independence. And uh, so, yeah, everybody brings uh, different uh, their knowledge expertise and to the expertise table. to the table. Yes. What excites you about working with patients uh, with dementia? It's very exciting at moment mm -hmm. um, uh, that when we when you see the results uh, from impl implementing the recovery plan of care, um, uh, that uh, say that um, a client has been very challenging and then you um, find a way to manage the behaviors and then you do see the results from it. It's very, uh, very rewarding. And uh, the, the, uh, the comments that you get from the family member when they mm -hmm. see that change in their loved one, it is also very uh, rewarding and exciting to see that. You mentioned family members, so I'm interested in knowing how Ontario Shores collaborates or works with families to improve patient outcomes. Well, um, uh, the, the Ontario Shores has been very supportive uh, to the family members and same as the geriatric dementia unit, uh, like all the staff members, we do love um, having the family come in, visit their loved ones, having their input, um, seeing how um, their past was, like getting a little bit of history and then, then we see them as a person, how they lived their life. So it, it's very helpful, very helpful with our providing care. And um, um, that we, they do um, arrange um, some uh, like fair, say summer barbecue and like a spring fair that the family can be here and be involved in uh, in uh, the, those uh, activities. Uh, activities. Unit, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and then um, yeah, it's, uh, they feel welcome to that way mm -hmm. to the unit and. Uh, um, we always uh, appreciate their input. You, you mentioned um, the family provides a little bit of history of the patients. So how, how does that help you? If you can clarify with your, with your practice on the unit to well, know when, about the patient. Yes, uh, when uh, when the when a patient comes to the unit, we mm -hmm. know uh, the person only with the disease process. Like mm -hmm. what they, they, a lot of patients change from uh, as they walk in. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, when once they get their uh, dementia, right? So we don't know, we wouldn't know uh, him as a whole person, how he lived his life or, right. or she lived his, mm -hmm. her life. Um, her the, occupation, what, their, what they right. did. Right. So it's very interesting mm -hmm. to find that out and, um, and to go, move forward, um, keeping that in mind. It, it's, it's very helpful. And, and I would presume also for like their personal preferences, like there might be some dietary preferences. Right, yeah, their likes and dislikes are right. Um, right. that also, mm -hmm. yes, it's very helpful. So I it, mean, they could play a role in their care, for example, their music, or if you're doing music therapy, to have that history, know what type of songs they like or music they like. Of course, yeah. yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very interesting that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the major uh, challenges? Would you say about? looking after patients with moderate to severe dementia based on your experiences? Well, the disease progression itself right. is a big challenge. Um, mm -hmm. they, um, they, their, um, their communication uh, barrier is mm -hmm. uh, like they're nonverbal. Some, sometimes they become nonverbal and then you have to look for their body language to right. um, mm -hmm. recognize the symptoms or the, their um, they, they could be in pain, so you, they won't be able to verbalize it. Right. So that you have to look it's for the body example. language yeah. to, mm -hmm. to um, recognize that. That is a challenge. So it could be misinterpreted sometimes, and then also um, their uh, language barrier. Say mm -hmm. that uh, they are uh, they spoke a different language, or even if they knew English, it forget they forget right. there, with and the they go back of dementia, to the, they go back yes, to their primary they go back language. To the tri right, yeah. uh, and then yeah. uh, it, it is also become a challenge uh, that they're not being able to communicate. Um, 
Yeah, I guess uh, those are the, the major, the major could, challenges. Uh, th think of yes, yeah. yeah, and then not the family, not like sometimes it's having their um, hard time accepting. So that from the family perspective, that they t they see these changes and they mm -hmm. don't quite understand or. And they know them, uh, their mother or the father, as their mm -hmm. what they were before this part right. of disease, and then the, it's very hard to um, to cope with that. So then we do have to um, kind of explain it to them what this disease process is like, and then right. help them through that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so a lot, so of, a lot of family education regarding the patient's condition and so forth, and how their condition will slowly change over time. Yes, and, yes. And, and deteriorate, unfortunately. That's yeah, right, yeah. And, yes. and what to expect, I think. That's right. Knowing what is coming around the corner. Yeah. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Nancy, I want to thank you for taking time uh, to talk to us and describe your role and your experiences on the clinical, on, on the uh, geriatric uh, dementia unit here at Ontario Shore. So, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for having me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to welcome Andra duff Waskowski. Uh, who's from Ontario Shore Centre for Mental Health. And I'd like to begin first, Andra, asking you, can you describe your role here at Ontario Shores? Sure, Wally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm the Administrative Director for our Geriatrics Program here, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, uh, Pharmacy uh, for the organization. Um, and so within my portfolio uh, in Geriatrics, we have three inpatient units. Uh, two inpatient units are devoted to uh, the care of uh, folks with dementia. Uh, and our mm -hmm. other inpatient unit is um, uh, devoted to the, uh, the care of uh, geriatric patients with uh, uh, significant mental health issues. Um, and then we also have a stream of about six uh, clinics, uh, mm -hmm. which are um, outpatient outreach teams uh, and also clinics uh, mm -hmm. in our uh, community. Now you mentioned care, so I'm wondering if you could comment mm -hmm. on how you feel or why you feel it is important to engage in interdisciplinary and interprofessional mm -hmm collaboration to take care of uh, these uh, these patients here at Ontario Shores. For sure. Yeah. Um, really, as with any healthcare environment, uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, care is best mm -hmm. uh, because it's really focused on the holistic view of a patient. Right. Yeah. Uh, every, every discipline has their own strength uh, and their own thoughts uh, on issues, including mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can all work together uh, to create the best plan along with the patient and their family. So it's, very, it's a very collaborative model then. Yeah. Extremely collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, and the other really great thing about it is the, the quality standards that we follow. So uh, Health Quality Ontario uh, has mm -hmm. a whole list of quality standards now for uh, healthcare. Right. Um, and uh, for the treatment of dementia and the treatment of uh, schizophrenia, um, really um, uh, the interdisciplinary approach is the gold standard. Um, so all of the d d disciplines can work together. Um, mm -hmm. They can also divide the tasks amongst themselves. So then all of the burden um, of uh, caring for someone or all of the tasks of caring for mm -hmm. someone with dementia uh, can be spread out amongst the team members. Mm -hmm. What excites you about working here at Ontario Shores and, and working mm -hmm. with patients and families with, with dementia? Mm -hmm. um, what excites me really is how innovative Ontario Shores is. Hmm. Um, we really were the first hospital to embrace uh, the quality standards uh, in mental health. Hmm. Uh, we do it really well. Um, so engaging our frontline staff uh, and our patients and their families. Um, we also monitor how we're doing. So we have a dashboard. Uh, mm -hmm. our, our, um, uh, our, sorry, our electronic health record is fully electronic. Mm -hmm. Our health record is fully electronic. Um, so we can pull data. Um, so we can see actually if we are uh, abiding to the fidelity of the quality standards. So that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Another thing that excites me about working here is um, I would say how we engage uh, families and patients uh, mm -hmm. in their care. Uh, so we're a recovery focused organization so it guides everything that we right. do um, mm -hmm. and truly that's what dementia care is all about. Um, uh, folks with dementia often cannot speak for themselves, talk about their history, talk mm -hmm. about their likes, and their wants, um, mm -hmm. and families do that for them. So uh, they're really partners in care. I mm -hmm. wonder if you can provide an example of, let's say, a typical patient on the unit, you know, mm -hmm. without any mentioning any names, of course, to yeah. for confidentiality, uh, confidentiality issues. But 
um, maybe just to give some idea of how you work with families to, to solve some of these uh, issues on clinical issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, so an example of a typical patient on our uh, unit, uh, patients are often living in long-term care facilities mm -hmm. um, and uh, their responsive behaviors due to dementia uh, are escalating. Um, and so they come to us, um, we see them for 59 days, we have a 59 day uh, mm -hmm. clinical pathway. Uh, the physicians uh, so go through, yeah, sorry yeah. for cutting you off here yeah, but just, so if you, you can just clarify what you mean by responsive behaviors if you can yep. give some examples yep, yeah absolutely yeah. Um, yeah. so these are behaviors that are um, often seen uh, in folks with dementia uh, and they're in response to something within the environment uh, or within the disease process that is triggering the behaviors right. mm -hmm. so it's it's they're not premeditated uh, they're not because of, um, you know, a vendetta against uh, a care provider or mm -hmm. um, a, a care, a partner. Um, this is part of the pathology. It's part of the pathology of dementia yeah. and it's really of no fault of that individual. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank mm -hmm. you, Wally. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, how the family members help us in that way mm -hmm. uh, is um, having a conversation uh, with us about about these individuals. So we had a particular individual who um, was always banging on an office door. Mm. He would get very, very loud and agitated uh, and would bang on the door. Um, and we, we had his partner in um, and we asked his partner why. Why would he want to get into this office? You know, he escalates every day at about this time. Mm -hmm. what, what could it be? What's uh, the trigger? What's the trigger? Right. And the partner mm -hmm. said he uh, was, was a CEO. Uh, and so a lot of his day was spent behind a computer. Uh, he was sitting at a desk for most of his day. Mm -hmm. He wants to sit at a desk. Uh, so the nurses uh, and the therapists created an office station oh, for really? him. That's, that's creative. Uh, yeah. Which is yeah. very creative. And so yeah. he would go there uh, every day when he started to get into this sort of um, agitation time right. of day normally for him. Uh, and this would calm him down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We would give him books to read at his desk. Uh, he could have a cup of coffee at his desk. Um, and so this is how you really have to use right. families as partners in care. So he was living his, his life experiences as a CEO, kind of reliving them to, That's right. to calm him down. Mm -hmm. That was the trigger. He wanted to get into the office to sit yes. behind a chair. That's yeah. right. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, I wonder if you could uh, provide some clinical examples mm -hmm. of typical uh, situations or challenges uh, that are faced with patients with severe and moderate dementia on the unit that staff have to deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so one of them would be, I think the most often that we see is uh, um, aggression or agitation during personal care. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's a very vulnerable time. It's often during a bath uh, or a shower. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in the patient's personal space. Uh, they're disrobed to a certain extent. Right. Yeah. Um, so they feel very vulnerable, I guess. Feel very vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and don't necessarily know what's happening, what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, so this is something we we, we have a challenges with almost every day. Um, so to really incorporate ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we use some aromatherapy. Uh, we'll use uh, lavender essential oils right, uh, yeah. prior to bath time to mm -hmm. calm the individuals down. Um, also music, uh, calming music. Um, and then talking uh, the patient through the whole process and being really calm and gentle, low voice, mm -hmm. um, calming voice. Mm -hmm. Um, another uh, common um, issue that we run into is wandering. So we really, really have to be cognizant of where all of our patients are. Um, patients can wander into other patients' rooms, uh, which can absolutely be a trigger uh, for mm -hmm. uh, a patient in their room if they were having a nap. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a really good uh, deterrent for wandering is providing meaningful and stimulating activities uh, for individuals to do. Um, so we have a snoozel in room, uh, which has some lights, uh, sensory activities, light, sound, touch, mm -hmm. Um, which tactile, is, tactile stimulation, yeah. stimulation, which is really helpful. And also um, aromatherapy is and present. Here. Absolutely, yeah, aromatherapy, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then interactions, uh, you know, staff and patient interactions, reminiscence therapy, so going through photo books mm -hmm. of this individual's uh, life, their children, their grandchildren. We have the families bring in a photo book for every patient oh, uh, yeah. so that you can go through this uh, with the patient mm -hmm. to interact with them, give them some stimulation and purpose, uh, and also it, it uh, helps to calm them down 
uh, and to build a rapport between the staff member and the patient. It also provides some context to provide care because you mentioned totally. that, that patient who was knocking on the door who was the CEO. So yeah. if they knew they were a CEO in their family, yeah. in that album, in their history, yeah. and that would give them context of, of why that trigger is happening as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, another uh, other things that we really have to be cognizant of on the unit is uh, sensitivity to sound uh, and sensitivity to lights. Right. Yeah. Um, so often dimming the lights, turning lights off uh, in certain areas uh, on the ward. Mm -hmm. um, and you always really have to be cognizant of the patients, uh, that grouping of patients at a particular time, mm -hmm. who's particularly loud, who is very sensitive to noise, uh, and really focus on um, interacting with activities at different areas uh, in the milieu. Mm -hmm. I would like to welcome uh, Julie Earl. Julie Earl is a nurse practitioner here at Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health in Whitby, Ontario. And Julie, I'm wondering we could, if we can start off by describing your current role at uh, Ontario Shores. Okay, so I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm actually the first ever nurse practitioner in the MRP role wow. in mental mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. I work on the geriatric dementia unit as the most responsible mm -hmm. provider, which means that I am the attending practitioner for the patients. We um, have 23 patients and I am responsible for them. So when you talk about responsible, you're responsible not only for admitting them and their day-to-day -day care, but also for discharge planning, Correct. I presume. So that, that it includes correct? the yeah. ability to admit them, uh, diagnose illness, treat illness, order any tests, order any medications they require, and discharge them from hospital. Comprehensive. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Based on your clinical experiences to date, I know that you had many over the years, uh, could you describe you, why interdisciplinary and interprofessional collaboration is important on your unit. Sure, so, so to start, I don't think you can have proper patient care without an interprofessional approach or an interdisciplinary mm -hmm. approach. We all bring our own particular expertises to the table and in the any patient population, but particularly in geriatric dementia patients where they can't um, express themselves and maybe don't <clears throat> have the resources to express themselves. Each profession brings the ability to provide a, a, a different approach to patient care. So, so the short answer is I don't, I don't think we could give our care without an interprofessional model including RNs and RPNs and our rec therapists, our OTs, our right. social workers. Mm -hmm. yeah. What excites you about working with patients with dementia? The ability to give them some quality of life. Mm -hmm. Our patients come exceptionally aggressive, exceptionally agitated. They're in a nursing home where they are um, <clears throat> not experiencing very much positivity in their daily activities. Often they're aggressive with care, maybe they're afraid, maybe they're agitated due to their disease. And we have the ability to work together as a team to settle that level of agitation, be it through pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions, and really give them and their families and the nursing home some quality of life back. Right, so it's not always about the quantity of life for these individuals with moderate to severe dementia. I think quality of life you quality. mentioned is, 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 yeah. is, is, the, is the cornerstone here. Exactly. Um, just c talking a little bit more about families, can you tell me how you work with families to solve some of these issues and to involve sure. them in, in their daily care? So the families are the biggest resource these patients have most of the mm -hmm. time and we rely really heavily on the families because the patients often in the moderate to severe stages can't um, that sometimes they're aphasic meaning they can't talk or they can't express their wishes mm -hmm. sometimes that's even why they're reacting um, and the family is really their voice. We, ne we, we need the family to provide patient-focused care and we really work to involve them in every step of the care. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the major challenges faced by patients with moderate and severe dementia? Could you perhaps give us some, sure. some examples? Some of the common sure, common some of the challenges. Common challenges. Yeah. So in moderate to severe stage dementia, mm -hmm. um, many changes can happen. 
One, they no longer are able to do their basic activities of daily living, meaning they might need assistance with feeding and bathing and dressing, but they also might not understand the world around them the way they previously were able. So there's a lot of vulnerability, and sometimes that vulnerability can present as aggression and agitation. So if someone's coming in and getting them washed, bathed, and dressed, they might not be able to understand and interpret that set of events very well, and that's when we can see some reactive or potentially aggressive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also see a lot of wayfinding, potentially some boredom, and when, they're, when we see those sorts of symptoms and etiologies, then we can also get some agitation, restlessness, exit seeking, wanting to go home, um, irritability because they don't have anything to attend to. <clears throat> And, and unfortunately, 20% of patients with dementia or neurocognitive disorder do have a component of aggression and agitation that we just can't solve. Mm -hmm. And in sometimes those cases, we use non-pharmacological interventions to further distract them and redirect them, and sometimes we have to use medications as well. Could you just give us an example of some of those non-pharmacological or behavior yeah, type of sure. interventions? That so we use a lot of music therapy that oh. always tends to go over very well. We bring in pets. We have doll therapy meaning we give them a lifelike baby mm -hmm. that they can nurture. We do a lot of um, uh, spiritual activities. We do a fair amount of um, crafts and, and gardening and cooking as we're able at, at a, a level that's appropriate for them. Um, we have a snoozelin room that can, that's a multi-sensory room to help provide some distraction and entertainment as well. Mm -hmm. Julie, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and talking to us about your role as a nurse practitioner and also taking care of families and patients uh, with, with dementia at Ontario Shores. Thank, thank you. you, thank yeah, you for having me. I'd like to welcome Sherry Horsborough from Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health. And uh, Sherry, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your role on the Geriatric Dementia Unit here at Ontario Shores. Yes, mm -hmm. thanks Wally. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm the clinical manager of the geriatric dementia unit. So mm -hmm. it's a 23 bed inpatient unit where we have patients who are primarily coming from long-term care uh, who have a, a diagnosis of dementia and have responsive behaviors. So uh, behaviors may be agitation, wandering, um, yelling out, and, and they're called responsive behaviors because they're behaviors that are intended to, to address some sort of need that the patient is having and it may be the only way that that um, individuals able to communicate that need. Um, so as a clinical manager, I oversee the daily operations, the staffing, the hiring, the budgeting, right. the program development. Um, part of my role as well is to oversee some outreach uh, clinicians who also help support patients as they go back to the community or maybe before they come into Ontario Shores um, to provide education to long-term care uh, um, staff as well as help provide sort of some assessments and and hopefully prevent patients uh, mm -hmm. having a need to come for an inpatient mm -hmm. assessment. I wonder if you could just provide a little bit of clarification of who is the typical sort of patient uh, that that comes onto the unit. You mentioned uh, 59 days and, and why that 59 days just just to clarify for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. so uh, most of our patients are going to be seniors so above the age of 65 um, and they are going to be individuals who are prime with a primary diagnosis of dementia, most often Alzheimer's or vascular mm -hmm. dementia, although mm -hmm. there are other types, including frontal temporal dementia, uh, that we may have patients with that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, so a mix of men and women, uh, they come from long-term care, um, and there's been something that's happened in long-term care, some sort of behavior that um, has become a challenge for that individual, for that family, and for that long-term care. Mm -hmm. So they come for an assessment and stabilization uh, of those uh, behaviors and they're with us as you said for 50 up to 59 days at which point we look to transition them back to their long-term care home uh, with ongoing support in the community through our outreach teams. Mm -hmm. um, so the assessment and stabilization can, can include looking at what medications the, the patient is taking. Um, sometimes it will be uh, reducing some of the medications. There may be lots of medications that and we have to sort of sort through which ones are 
impacting which Making behaviors. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we also look at non-farm interventions, non-pharmacological interventions. So things like aromatherapy, music therapy, weighted blankets, warm blankets, um, meaningful activities for our, our patients uh, because sometimes we may discover that some of the behaviors are coming out because of perhaps boredom or something of that nature. So um, we as a clinical team, we have a broad uh, interdisciplinary team that supports looking at how to assess and stabilize the patient and return them um, you know, with a reduction in those behaviors. You mentioned in interdisciplinary team on the unit. Can you tell me from your clinical experiences as a manager on the unit why you feel it's important to engage in interdisciplinary or, or interprofessional uh, collaboration? I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's a very important factor, I think, of uh, the success of our uh, working on the unit is having that broad perspective from so many different disciplines or professionals is everybody brings unique ideas and unique approaches uh, that can really support our patients. And um, here at Ontario Shores, we follow a recovery philosophy. And the idea behind recovery is looking holistically at the individual as well as ensuring that it's, it's a very individualized, unique plan for each patient. So uh, that requires us to reach out and involve many different disciplines uh, to provide that care. You know, a patient may have an issue around falls that our occupational therapist can help support. Our right. recreational yep. therapist is critical in helping us look at some of these non-pharmacological interventions. Mm -hmm. Obviously our nursing team is there uh, to provide that frontline support, medication administration, one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy, therapeutic relationship building. Um, so everybody plays a really critical role in, in moving towards sort of recovery for our patients. Yeah, excellent. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what excites you about working here? at Ontario Shores and working with patients and families with, with dementia. Yeah, what excites me is, um, you know, again, I think there's a focus on uh, quality uh, in terms of our care and quality of life. So mm -hmm. um, it's really, I think, a partnership between our teams, our clinical teams, and our patients and our families. And it excites me to see that collaboration between everyone with the same goal in mind. Everyone's goal is to uh, improve the quality of life for our patients with dementia. Um, and that's going to be a little bit different for each individual. Um, and so so really striving for following best practice, looking at new and innovative ways to do things, uh, thinking outside of the box. Again, I think, um, you know, there are situations where um, oftentimes somebody's behaviors may be reverting back to sort of what was their occupation, what was their life, um, and they're remembering some sort of those mm -hmm. details. So it requires us to be innovative and think out of the box in terms of supporting them in mm -hmm. feeling comfort. You know, Could you provide our listeners with an example perhaps of uh, how some of the innovative thinking out of the box sort of interventions you may have done on, on the unit? to help families and, and patients here? Yeah. Yeah, so my mind goes mm -hmm. to um, uh, an individual whose uh, background was as an engineer. And um, so somebody who had often been working with their hands, been very busy, very um, me mechanically inclined. Uh, and as they came onto the unit, one of the things was that they would um, be looking to work with any item that they would find and this was also something that was happening in the long-term care home um, and so you know it can be portrayed as sort of a destructive behavior because this individual was looking to take things apart oh, try to understand okay, what was going on so it was really trying to channel that into hmm. something that was safe for the patient to take apart or work through um, and that they could manipulate and use their hands. So again, it was really trying many different strategies um, to kind of keep this individual very active. Um, another situation is, you know, often uh, we had a gentleman who um, reminisced a, lo a lot about sort of his life as a golfer and sort of, you know, would be moving items around the, furn around the unit to sort of replicate or remind him of sort of being on a golf course and was very busy again because you know used to that being out walking the golf course so yeah. it's really looking at how can we bring some peace by replicating sort of what experience they're trying to uh, live through and mm -hmm. um, you know we look to sort of the future as well about how we can utilize um, you know games interactive games things of that nature to sort of help replicate what that person's experience was and that mm -hmm. they are um, they are reminiscing about. Mm -hmm. 
Could you comment a little bit, um, Sherry, about some of the major challenges, in your opinion, uh, currently facing patients with dementia on the unit, with severe and moderate forms of dementia? Some of the major challenges that you see clinically on a daily basis. Yeah, um, so there are a number <laughs> of things that come to mind. Um, you know, again, aggressive behaviors during personal care is something mm -hmm. that is quite common and um, is is difficult for the patients themselves. They are mm -hmm. often feeling a bit maybe disoriented it's about. Very stress sort of, provoking for them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're vulnerable mm -hmm. in in any time mm -hmm. of personal care, and mm -hmm. so um, helping to find uh, ensuring that our staff and our teams are following an approach that is really um, focused on the patient, understanding what their triggers might be. Um, how we can protect sort of their dignity and privacy uh, and what is important to them. And again, just trying to think out of the box and be uh, innovative about um, not having a, a one size fits all sort of approach, but recognizing that uh, for one patient, it might be um, a calm approach that is really giving lots of direction before and after. Uh, another, it might be really trying to help support a patient understand that they can do it and how we can help them sort mm -hmm. of achieve that. They may be the more independent person who wants to not have their clothes set out for so them, but very, participate. Very, very personalized to the, Absolutely. To the patient themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so um, part of our medical record is a, is a recovery plan of care where we capture those personalized details. Um, maybe it's around eating, maybe it's around dressing, those things. Um, another major challenge I would say is uh, for our population and given their stage of dementia is risk of falls um, and protecting our patients as best we can from mm -hmm. any kind of uh, mitigating that risk. Uh, oftentimes again that's an individual, individualized sort of um, situation where for some family members uh, and patients the recovery goal may be to maintain ambulation as long as possible, even when we see that that gait may be somewhat unstable. Um, and so it's trying to, again, be creative, uh, recognizing um, you know, that the recovery plan is to be uh, based on what the, the individual or the family member who's acting as the substitute decision maker mm -hmm. really feels is in the best interest of the patient and doing our best to support moving in that direction in the safest way possible. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I wonder if you can comment um, just what happens with the transition process. That means transitioning back from the uh, geriatric dem dementia unit back into a long-term care facility or sometimes even back into the home. How do you what is the process there? If you can just tell us a little bit about that and yeah. how that works. Yeah. So throughout a patient's stay, obviously we're partnering with family and we're partnering with um, wherever that patient has come from. So if they've come from a long-term care, Home, we're partnering with that home mm -hmm. um, to have frequent touch points around communication about, you know, how is the patient doing? What are we seeing as mm -hmm. that progress? Um, as and again, obviously, really involving family to help guide a lot of that information gathering right. about who they are as a person, what are their likes and dislikes, and how we can best support them. Um, so again, we have multiple touch points throughout that 59-day stay where we're involving family as well as our partners in long-term care, uh, where the patient. May be returning. Um, at the time of discharge, so we, we would help hold a meeting at least sort of at, at once uh, midpoint of the stay around mm -hmm. the 30-day mark and then again seven to 14 days before we're planning to discharge. It allows us to have that information sharing, it allows us to address any questions or concerns. Uh, we also involve in those meetings our outreach team, so those, fam those members of our team that are going to see the patient when they return. Um, so we try to set up a really um, smooth process as best we can. Uh, so everybody has the knowledge about the patient and what to expect. Uh, and then as we approach that day of discharge, um, you know, again, we look to send our staff or often family will transport the uh, individual back to the long-term care home. We provide written information. We're available by phone. We make a call to sort of give that transfer of accountability, what to expect. Um, and then within seven days of the patient being returned back to the long-term care home facility, somebody from our outreach team will be connecting and seeing the patient and, and addressing any issues. Um, times of transition can be very, very difficult for uh, patients with dementia. Um, and so that can sometimes lead to sort of a physical uh, decline or a decline in terms of those behaviors because of 
simply because of that transition time. So we know it's a time to be intensely focused on supporting the patient. Right. Whether that transition is coming onto our unit or leaving our unit, we want to make sure everybody has the resources available to help support that. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. I just want to thank you, Sherry, for taking time to talk about your role and all the exciting things you're doing on the Geriatric Dementia Unit here at Ontario Shores. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Yeah. I'd like to welcome Stephanie Ross, who's a registered nurse and also a charge nurse on the Geriatric Dementia Unit at Ontario Shores Centre for um, mental health here in Whitby, Ontario. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your role, Stephanie, uh, on the Geriatric Dementia Unit here. I'd like to welcome Stephanie Ross. And Stephanie Ross is a registered nurse here at Ontario Shores uh, Centre for Mental Health in Whitby, Ontario. And uh, Stephanie uh, is also a charge nurse on the Geriatric Dementia Unit. Uh, so Stephanie, I wonder if you can just tell me a little bit about your role here at Ontario Shores and, and a little bit about what you do on the Geriatric Dementia Unit. Well, I'm a registered nurse and uh, on the unit, you know, we go about day-to-day -day activities with our patients, uh, whether that's helping them with their activities of daily living, uh, we want to help them get dressed in the morning, get them up and ready for the day. Uh, we'll bring them out to the day area to start our programs that we have on the unit. Uh, we will help facilitate with their um, medication administration. Um, and uh, we would make sure that all documentation was taken care of and our assessments, our nursing assessments and tools that we do on the unit on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm, excellent. Based on your clinical experiences, uh, could you tell me why you think it's important uh, to engage in interdisciplinary and interprofessional collaboration to take care of patients with dementia? Well, I think um, it's um, very, very important to have all disciplines on the healthcare team uh, come together to collaborate to facilitate what's best for our patients on the unit. Uh, everyone has a different specialty that you know they bring forth, whether it's dietary, occupational health, um, therapeutic recreation staff, the nursing, the psychiatrist, everyone has their, you know, the input that they want to help, you know, patients uh, set their recovery goals. Mm -hmm. What excites you about working with patients with dementia here at Ontario Shores? My favorite thing with working with uh, patients with dementia is the small victories that you get. Uh, whether they're the lucid moments where they might recognize their family member for maybe even 30 seconds or so, mm. but that interaction is, is priceless. Mm. And um, when they start remembering a song that you start playing the music to and they start When singing. they're doing music therapy yes, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or if we just play mm -hmm. the music, you know, throughout the unit on, in mm -hmm. the day area and they start coming up and dancing, you know, to the music. It's, it's quite a, a special thing to witness that. Now you mentioned families. Uh, could you tell me or your how you worked with families to provide care for patients on the unit? How you collaborate with families to provide the best care? We're always looking for new ways to actually implement family participation on the unit. Uh, when our patients are admitted to the unit, we uh, give them a tour of the facility. Then they're always setting up a family meeting at first, and uh, then we'll discuss things that uh, programs and. Mm. Um, or services available throughout the hospital, like the patient portal is a new service where they have access to the charts or certain areas of the charts. Hmm. And um, So this is an online? Yes, yes. an yeah. online. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a new implementation that they've done recently. And then we also have the Family Resource Centre that we can help um, uh, give them resources you know, for dementia care as well. Um, so dementia care, dementia information for mm. families, and clarifications, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, access to the unit 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, we, we, you can call anytime. Oh, There's really? always someone mm -hmm. there. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the major challenges, would you say, working with uh, patients with moderate to severe dementia, based on your clinical experience? What are some of the major challenges that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I would say the, um, you know, the degenerative, degenerative disease mm. process in general, you know, the loss right. of independence is uh, really hard for patients, um, especially uh, when they're really starting to realize that, you know, the diagnosis is true, the dementia, that um, they're having a hard time coping with the mm -hmm. illness and the families have a really hard time coping with the illness right. as well. Um, but, you know, we try to strive to help facilitate, you know, quality of life 
for right. the patient yeah. and because their families. Because there, there is no cure for dementia. No. It's, it's all about quality of life yes. ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the best part to yeah. maintain and uh, the best quality of life, of life possible. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank, thank you, you so much for yeah. having me. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Reed. Sarah Reed is a recreational therapist here at Ontario Shore Center uh, for Mental Health in Whitby, Ontario. And uh, Sarah, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about this room. It's called a Snoozelin room, but I wonder if you can provide our, our viewers here uh, with a little bit of a description of the various um, items here in, in this room. Okay, so right now we're in the Snoozelin room. So the the purpose behind a snoozeland room is to either heighten or uh, reduce people's uh, arousal for senses. So what I use it for here on the geriatric dementia unit is more of like a relaxation uh, technique. And it's one of our non-pharmacological interventions that we use on this unit. In the snoozeland room, we have a few different wall panels that if people are really tactile and they want to touch different uh, things on the walls, we have some shapes that they can go through and look at that are different colors and uh, have different patterns on them. We have like a gear wall panel that if somebody was really mechanical before, they might uh, find this pretty interesting to work with. Um, we also have some strips that people can braid or um, just hold in their hands, put their fingers through the different circles. Uh, we have a projector that has a few different discs on it. So there's one that's butterflies, one that's the changing of the four seasons. This is the under the water one. So depending on someone's background and their leisure interests, I might change the disc accordingly so that they'll be uh, most interactive with whatever disc I put in. Um, we have a few sensory items within the room. This is like a massage ring that some people who are really tactile and like to hold things might find comfort in. Um, it can give their joints a bit of a massage as well. Then we have um, like a light feature on this panel. So depending on the way that you control the, um, the converters here, depends on the pattern that'll show up and how fast or slow the pattern might move and you can pause pause it or speed it up we also have another light feature that's a mat down here so this once you step on the star it'll change colors um, and it'll light up so you guys can kind of talk about when I'm in here with someone, I'll talk to them one-on-one -on -one about different colors that they might see in the room or things like that. Um, this was a fine motor feature that I was talking about before. So if somebody likes to uh, braid the ropes together, that can be something they can do. That's a little bit more gross motor. Or if you have someone that is really into more so delicate um, activities, if they just pinch uh, the strand of light. It makes a new light within the shimmering curtain there. Um, and then there's also just a little massage mat here that if somebody has back pain or something like that and they have more of a sensory um, craving in their back and they respond well to the touch of, or they respond well to feel, then you can put on the sensory mat to give them a bit of a, a massage throughout the room. So another non-pharmacological intervention that we have on GDU is uh, robotic pets. We also have a pet that comes, a therapy dog Jasmine that comes every week, but when Jasmine's not here, we have these robotic pets. So if people have been pet owners for years prior, sometimes having a cat or a dog beside them can provide them some comfort and help reduce agitation and stress. So there's certain sensors on the pets that once you um, touch the pet in a certain part of the fur, then they might bark or move their head or wag their tail or certain things like that. So it's just a nice reminder um, for pet lovers on our unit.